morning and welcome to all the folks who are worshiping online with us this morning. It is just great to welcome everyone. I'm Annette Stiles Pendergrass, one of the pastors here at Sun Tree. And uh, while as I'm welcoming you, I also want to encourage you to let us know that you're worshiping with us today um, by checking in with us. You can do that by going to our website, suntreeumc.org, and on the homepage there, there is a check-in button. You can use the church app that hopefully you've downloaded on your phone, and again, when you open the app, there on the homepage is a check-in button, or you can use your um, camera app on your phone and point it to the QR code on the screen, and that'll take you to a link that will also uh, walk you. You can walk through the process of signing in. And as you do that, uh, let us know for sure if you happen to be a first-time guest or visitor with us. Uh, maybe you've been a couple of weeks, but you've never tapped that little first-time guest uh, indication. We'd love for you to do that. Uh, we'd love to be able to send you some information about our church and some of its ministries. Um, there is also a yellow card. You can do it that way. Let us know if you're a first-time guest. Um, those cards are out in the lobby on the table, um, and you can pick up one of those, fill it out, and then leave it on the table or give it to one of the ushers. And again, that way we can be in touch with you. So we'd love to do that. But it's great to welcome everyone to worship today. There are lots of things that are going on. It is summer, uh, but summer's a busy time just in different ways around here, right? Different kinds of busy. And, um, but today in worship, we are continuing in our Follow Me message series, um, specifically thinking about what it means to follow Jesus to freedom. And uh, we will be looking at the passage from Luke's gospel, the healing of the woman who was bent over. And uh, we look forward to a wonderful message from Pastor Allie this morning around that uh, scripture. And then uh, coming up this week is our children's art camp um, that begins on Monday, or yes, Monday morning, tomorrow morning. But the wonderful, exciting thing for you is that you get to see some of the art that the children produced this week. We will have that artwork a little student art show over in the dining room next Sunday after worship and before worship between the services. So we invite you, encourage you to wander over there and uh, check out some of the fruits of our children's labor this week. Um, it, it should be a lot of fun and we look forward to that. And then coming up next Sunday afternoon, beginning at 3 o'clock, is our screening of the movie The Best of Enemies. This is a movie version of a true story of a relationship between a civil rights social activist and a member of the KKK, and how they came together, found relationship, and were able to work together for a common cause. It's really an amazing story. And so if you're in person, you'll be able to watch the movie. We'll begin the movie at 3 o'clock, and we'll watch the movie together, and then there'll be small group conversation following that. If you are not ready to come out and participate in in-person events at this point, you can join us online at 3 o'clock. You'll have to watch the movie on your own, and then at 3 o'clock, an online Zoom discussion will begin. Um, so you can engage in conversation with other folks um, around the movie. So um, we invite you to participate participate in either way. This is brought to us by the work of our beloved community committee as we as a church continue to explore and learn and grow together around issues related to justice and equality. Um, and so we're looking forward to this. It should be a lot of fun. We do need your reservation, uh, both in person and online. We'd love to know how many people are coming um, so we can plan for small groups. And also, if you need childcare, you need to let us know that as well. We are offering some special children's activities during this time, so uh, we look forward to that as well. So we hope that you'll be able to come and share that with us. And then we are celebrating a huge thank you to everyone who prayed for or made possible in some other way our Brevard Mission Week. This is a picture of all of the young people that were here during the week. Our youth were joined by three other um, student ministries from other churches. All of, you know, it's a really cool thing that the three churches that came, the leaders that brought them are all graduates of our youth ministry program who have gone on to do youth ministry in other places or um, even pastoral ministry as in the case of uh, Will Kenda. So, 
uh, it was just an amazing week, and we are grateful for everyone helping to make it possible. The, uh, I forget how many hours of service. I think thousands of hours of service, and Joel actually <laughs> noted that today at, at 930. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to say 1,500. It was something like that, so hours of service that were um, done during the week. So what a, what a blessing. So we thank you for that. And then um, our Harbor City Elementary back to school drive continues throughout this month. Um, we have this Sunday and next Sunday to meet our goal. And um, I am holding the backpack here as a reminder that we are still collecting these monies. Um, here is a short video from the principal at Harbor City, City Elementary. Watch. I am Joy Salamon, and I'm the principal at Harbor City Elementary School. And we have a population of about um, 400 students. They are all free and reduced lunch. We are um, working hard to help them overcome COVID. It's been a hard time for everybody, and we are trying really, really hard to make things right for children in our community. The impact of your church has made on our children is unbelievable. You come in and you come in here every week and you listen to our children. You let them talk to you. You let them tell you their stories. You let them, talk, you let them tell you what they need. So. I just have to say that there isn't a better thing than you can do than to come and work with the children themselves. We have been able to do so many things that you have given us the money or given us the resources or the, the gift cards to be able to go out in our community and get them the things that they need to start school on an equal basis with everybody else. For the, um, for the gift cards, what we decided to do was to let the kids go out and buy their own things um, with your gift cards. So they can go out and we give, the, first we get them a list and we hand it to them and then we send them out to go um, to do that. Then they have purchased it themselves. So they feel like they were part of being able to do that. All throughout the month of July, we will be accepting cash or check donations that we will use to purchase gift cards for the families of Harbor City. With your help, our goal is that every student will walk into class fully prepared to achieve success in the school year ahead. There will be special envelopes in the bulletin each week and backpacks in our worship spaces where you can leave your gift and say a prayer for these students and families. You can also make a gift online at centuryumc.org slash give by choosing Harbor City Supply Drive from the drop-down fund menu. I've had the blessing to be able to meet um, with the principal, past, uh, Principal Joy, um, on a number of occasions. And she is just so grateful um, for the partnership that we share and the support that we provide to, to her, to the teachers, and to the students there. Um, I am very excited to report that, as I said, we have two more Sundays left, but right now we have raised um, more than $6,500 towards these gift cards, which is absolutely amazing. We're about halfway there at this point. And so um, I trust in the generosity of this congregation and have no doubt that we'll be able to meet that goal. And just one final word, that word about prayer um, that Grace mentioned in her closing, um, no matter what you can or can't do, maybe you can't go and be at the school and serve in that way. Maybe right now you can't help with the gift card. But we do invite you to be in prayer for the teachers and for the students and families that are a part of this partnership. And they, they covet those prayers. So thank you. And now we'll continue in worship. Good morning. I'm Robert Bland, the director of 
traditional music here at Sun Tree, and it is my uh, privilege to add my word of welcome to you also. Let's begin with a responsive call to worship. I invite you please to stand and join me. With great rejoicing, we come to the house of the Lord today. The power and love of God flow through this gathering. Come, let us worship the Lord. One way that we celebrate is by singing together. I hope you'll join me, please. Say with me, please, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may 
please be seated. And yet another good morning. I am Grace Stiles Williams, the director of Welcome and Outreach here. I am so happy to see all of you and for those worshiping online. I have one more announcement to make. We are having, a, we are working with Family Promise for the week of July 24th through the 30th. In the pre-COVID times, we would have been hosting them, um, but due to the pandemic and due to some ongoing uh, systems, they will be staying in hotels and we will be providing food, good, warm, homemade dinners, lunches. So if you are interested in helping provide the food or delivering them to the families, please contact me. You can email me, find me at the website. Uh, we would love to keep supporting these families and have as many folks as possible join us. Now, will you join me in prayer today? Lord of healing, we come to you with heads bowed and backs bent. The burdens on our shoulders are heavy. You alone know of all the weight we carry. We are weary, Lord, laden with fears and anxieties, grief and loss, addiction, illness, envy, and contempt. Some days the weight of the world drags us down so far that it feels impossible to look up. We are unable to see you because we are so focused on simply not falling apart. We long for someone to see us, to notice the weight upon our shoulders, to offer relief even if just for a moment. And Lord, you always see us. You are always there to truly look at us for who we are, past our struggles and through our pain. You alone are able to offer the deepest relief. It is through your grace that we find healing, that we can begin the process of setting our burdens down so that we may stand up a little straighter raise our heads a little higher because in the miracle of being seen we too can see others when we are not so weighed down we can properly see the ways that others are struggling lord of healing you always know our burdens but you also know our joys as the giver of good and every righteous thing, you know just what we need to heal a little more each and every day. A hug from a friend, the laughter of a child, the gift of sharing a meal with a community. May your gift of seeing others extend to our offerings today. We pray that this moment of generosity does your work of alleviating burdens to allow all of us, the blessed, bent over people, to stand up a little straighter and lift our heads a little higher. We ask that you dedicate these gifts toward your work of freeing lives by releasing us from the things that hold us down. We do all this in your name as we pray the prayer your son taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Before the first step of any journey, there is an invitation, an offer to share a road and walk together to a common destination. Along this path, we find that our different backgrounds make us better traveling partners, a community called to share our burdens, to push each other forward, to develop gifts, and to live out our call together. What if this is what Christ meant when he said, follow me? Not a command, but an invitation. And we, the church, must travel together, united by the one who is leading us. We choose to step forward together and answer Christ's call to follow me. Our scripture from this morning, for this morning, comes from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles or however you read scripture. We begin in verse 10. Now he was teaching on, in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with the spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey away from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here together be pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Every united, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, can you turn that down just like a hair? That is a me thing, that's not a you thing, that's loud in my ear. <sighs> sorry. It's something every time, isn't it? They're really tired of me back there, I bet. Um, every United Methodist Church I have ever been to, my home church, all of the churches that I have ever interned at, and there were quite a few in college and in seminary, and even this church, think that the way they do communion is the right way. And every United Methodist Church that I have ever been to, all across my many, many years of seeing lots of different worship, has done communion differently. It does not matter whether they do intinction with pita or with King's Hawaiian, my personal favorite, or whether they do it in the trays or they have juice or whatever they do, no matter what they do. One church had freshly baked bread every Sunday. That was fun too. No matter what they do, whether it's weekly or monthly or quarterly or whenever they felt like it, whatever it was, their way of doing communion was the right way, the way of old, the way things should be done. The funny thing is, when you study even a little bit the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, the only two things that he cared about in relationship to communion is one, that we did it as often as possible, every day if we could, and two, that as many people as possible, in fact, all people, should have access to the communion table. The spirit of the law and the letter of the law and the difficulty between. 
I was with a group last Sunday, and we were talking about a different kind of parable, about a group of monks who had, to, who had a cat that was in their monastery, and it made a lot of noise, and so they got into the habit of tying up the cat to keep it quiet while they meditated. Why they thought that would work, I do not know. Eventually, the first cat and all of the other first monks that, of that group died, but hundreds of years later, that group of monks was still tying up cats as a best practice for meditation. The spirit of the law and the letter of it. We do communion the way that we do often in United Methodist churches, not for holiness's sake, not for righteousness's sake, but because of logistics and accessibility and what's available to the people there. And that is the spirit of the law and the letter of the law, too. It's a difficult thing to discern which is which sometimes. The Pharisees in our story today get a bad rap, but they were really just stuck in the same kind of situation. God gave them the Sabbath for a very good reason, to care for their bodies and their families and to worship God one day a week out of all the other days that they worked. Yet over hundreds and thousands of years, the rule for some had lost its spirit. And instead, the application of it in the, te in the temple was intent on oppressive rightness. And Jesus was never in a great relationship with these guys, but by the time we get here in Luke chapter 13, he is really starting to get on their nerves. Each time Jesus visits a synagogue and it's recorded, there's what some might call an altercation, a kerfuffle. Like in his calling narrative in Luke chapter 4, for instance, when they try to throw him off a cliff, that I would call a bad Sunday. But this will be the last time recorded in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is in the synagogue. The Pharisees have already begun to take a more antagonistic relationship with him, and this altercation will change the narrative irreparably, forcing Jesus to the cross. We find Jesus in the story in worship teaching as a part of his role as a rabbi and as a faithful Jewish person. And we can imagine that the plethora of examples of Jesus upsetting the Pharisees in the synagogue has to do with the amount of time that Jesus spent in the synagogue himself. He was there often, and so they butted heads often too. In the midst of this regular habit, he sees the woman in the crowd, a woman who is bent over. Scripture says that a spirit had crippled her for 18 years. 18 years! That is a long, long time. Painfully, despondently long. Those of you who have dealt with chronic pain or long recoveries from injuries know that to deal with this kind of debilitating pain for all of that time would have completely altered this woman's orientation to the world. She was bent over, looking at her feet. She couldn't look up and see the world around her, couldn't see very easily the sky. It would have probably been hard to hug other people. It would have been hard to do daily tasks. 18 years. That kind of pain and that kind of orientation over all that time would have caused a kind of despondency and a kind of despair. Honestly, the fact that she's still in the synagogue after all this time is something that as a modern person, I celebrate. There she is showing up even amidst all that pain. The language of the evil spirit reflects the orientation of the time and towards ailments like the ones that she had. But it reminds us that we, there are things we can see are wrong, and there are often so many things that we cannot see that ail and burden and hang on to us and others all the time. And despite the fact that some commentaries say her disability made her unseen, it was really just her status as a woman in the synagogue that made her mostly ignored by the religious authorities of that day. Plus, the sometimes Jewish orientation to injury as a result of sin would have made, at minimum, the folks around her wonder 
And at maximum, the folks around her blame her for her condition. She still shows up, yet there's not a lot of room for her in the bustle of the religious expression of the people. Yet, Jesus sees her. Jesus sees her, this woman. She does not cry out or go to him. She does not repent or throw herself onto the ground. Jesus can see what is tormenting her and ministers to her in that moment, healing her. 18 years of pain lifted. The spirit is gone. She stands up straight and her whole life is different. Her chains fell off and she was free. Pause there for a moment before we go to the reaction of the Pharisee. What has you captive? What is it in your life that Jesus needs to see? Where is it that you have experienced pain and despondency and depression? This week in preparation for this sermon, I spent some of my quiet time reflecting on the phrase, let Jesus see you. Let Jesus see you. Stand before him and open your hands, not just for the ailments that we other people can see, but for the ones that are hidden underneath all of that outward veneer. Let Jesus see you. Don't make, think you have to make some grand attempt. Let Jesus see you. There is no barrier between you and what Jesus can see. Let Jesus see you. The woman is seen by Jesus, seen by him. He takes the initiative and she is healed. She begins praising God and giving thanks to God in the true spirit of what the Sabbath was all about. Jesus sees her and she is free. And then the religious folks get mad. The NRSV says that the leader of the synagogue became indignant that Jesus had healed, had done work on the Sabbath. He is caught up in his interpretation and sees any miracle, any kind of work, as antithetical to the purpose of the Sabbath. True Sabbath practice does involve the cessation of all work. The day is for praising God, not work, not chores, but leisure and worship dedicated to enjoying God and enjoying God's creation. As a side note, I do think that we as American Christians could learn a little bit from the Jewish people about Sabbath, and even now, Orthodox Jews celebrate Sabbath in a way that is so much richer than we do. We, as American Christians, often don't pause long enough to be seen by Jesus, let alone to spend time with him for a whole day. Robert mentioned at the earlier service, examples of this include that Orthodox Jewish people don't turn on lights, they don't start their car, they don't pick up the phone, or they shouldn't pick up the phone on the Sabbath day, because all of that is work. And so they hold it to its highest esteem. Sabbath is made for humans, but we struggle to pause. But I digress, that's probably a me thing. The synagogue leaders chastise him for breaking the rules. Well, really, they chastise the people for coming to Jesus at all. They don't speak directly to Jesus. They're talking to the crowd sort of around Jesus. And so Jesus responds to them, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? You see, there were provisions for caring for animals and others in your care on the Sabbath day. You couldn't just ignore your livestock for a whole day. You couldn't ignore your children that couldn't help themselves on the Sabbath day. You couldn't neglect tying or untying your animals to have them be sustained. 
And Jesus sees what has happened to this woman, and in the Greek it's even clearer, sees what has happened to this woman as a loosing of her, just as there was provision, exception made for the loosing of animals. She was bound by her ailment, and now she is free, let loose. She was released from her bondage. And Jesus asks, isn't there room for the Sabbath for that, in the Sabbath for that? At the end of the scripture, Luke says, when Jesus was finished, his detractors were put to shame and everybody praised him for all that he was doing. Yet we know that's not really the end of this story or the end of this relationship. The Pharisees would never be content with the rule breaking that Jesus wanted to do. And that would eventually take them to the cross where Jesus means to live into the love and the spirit and the true meaning of God's law, the Pharisees want to push down on the letter of it. I don't know that they want to do that particularly at the expense of other people, but I do think that they think people are enough, are okay as collateral damage for their righteousness and their rule following. And it isn't as though Jesus rejects the Sabbath either. No, Jesus sees the Sabbath for what it is, a way to care for human beings. And what is more caring than the opportunity to heal this woman, unseen by most of the crowd, and release her to praise God and to be free from the thing weighing on her? What is more true about God's desire than that? Fred Craddock says, the peace of the way things have always been is shattered by the word and the deed of Jesus. If helping a stooped woman creates a crisis, then a crisis it has to be. We know that eventually the Pharisees will crucify Jesus for, the de for defying the law and calling himself the Son of God. These moments of controversy when Jesus stands up and heals, when he stands up for the Spirit of God's law, are the beginning of that slow walk to the cross. This makes us uncomfortable. That quote makes us uncomfortable. When I read the word crisis in all of this commentary by Fred Craddock, I thought, gosh, I cannot do one more crisis. Yet freedom and love and God's love are often more difficult than we can imagine. The living out of that love are more difficult than we can imagine. In this story, Jesus' orientation is to two things. Freedom for the woman and freedom to the spirit of God's love. Our, our discipleship can probably be described in these two ways too. Jesus sees us and heals us and saves us and we experience that evangelical sort of heartwarming salvation experience and Jesus calls us to hard, difficult walks with others, love with skin on. Any of you who are married and have family know that real love, unconditional love, is difficult work. In our discipleship, that's love that might get us in trouble, that might cause a crisis. That walk, that love for people like the civil rights leaders got them arrested and harmed and hurt. And over the centuries, many have been martyred in the name of that love. We cannot divorce one experience from the other. Jesus seeing us and, call, and Jesus calling us. Jesus saving us and freeing us. And Jesus asking us to live that out. That freedom is what it means to be a disciple. And the freedom given to us is also freedom to commit to agree to what it means to work for God's kingdom. That freedom is for something. And Jesus here is reminding us that at the ultimate center of God's law is a love for us that is so expansive, that is so unrelenting, that is so amazing and powerful, that it would defy even our most earnest and well-meaning barriers to get to us and to get to other people, to love all of us 
really seriously. Jesus saw this woman and ministered to her when no one else would. Who can we see and minister to when no one else will? How can we challenge our own habit, our own ritual, our own boxes, and follow that expansive love of God to love and be loved in new and freeing ways? I will say, to give you all credit, especially in this whole communion thing, Century is a pretty flexible church. I, even as a young person that really does not like change at all, score very low on the adaptability thing (laughs) on any of those personality inventories. I have noticed and have learned for your desire to continue to adapt and mold your ministry to make the most sense for the people that you want to reach. And someone told me when I arrived that part of that is because there is, you all don't lean into this is the way we've always done things because there's probably not a way we've always done things. And you can remember what the first way you did things was and how that's changed. You're only 38, 39 years old, right? So you're pretty young in in the grand scheme. And I thought about that a little bit as I considered what had to happen in 2020 in the pandemic. I remember March, I will never forget in my whole life, March 15th, 2020, a group of us gathered for the last time in that small of a space, and we decided that this, that was going to be our last Sunday of worship for a few, what we thought was going to be a few weeks um, in the month of March. And from that Sunday all the way into the next Sunday, we had seven days to figure out what we were going to do about online worship. And people like Mike Mays and John Barton and Ed Dunn and a whole team of tech people came together, Robert Lamb and Tom Taylor, all of us came together to figure out how we were going to transition to a pre-recorded worship service. And we did it. And that was amazing. And most churches had a really hard time making that shift in the same level of quality that we were able to make. And so we were really grateful. I'm still really grateful that we had the resources to do that. And then, so that was March 20th, right? So then a couple weeks later was our first communion Sunday for online worship. And there were bishops and other churches around the country in the Methodist church too that said, nope, you cannot do online communion. Not allowed. It's not what it's for. You're not supposed to do it when you're all apart. What are you opening the door to? There were all these kinds of questions. No. And some bishops forbade their churches in their conferences from hosting online communion, which was pretty extreme, I thought. And I felt really lucky as a young person who did not make the decision that Bishop Carter and Annette had a similar response. Bishop Carter said, this is a pastoral choice. Here are some reasons you could do this. Here are some reasons you don't have to do this. But it's contextual, and I'm going to let you all decide. And Annette said... In the spirit of your flexibility, we're going to put people over what we think our rules are. And so we did online communion. And we got lots of photos over that time that we were all apart. Goldfish and toast and cookies and all kinds of different kinds of bread. And then lots of different kinds of beverages. Some of them I won't mention this morning um, what they were. Coffee and juice and other things. Uh, for online communion. And some of you still, you know, if you're still worshiping with us online, we have every month or so we record a new online portion of communion because we know it is still not uh, safe or accessible for everyone to come back and to experience communion in person. We still have prepackaged elements. Those are not my favorite. But we still have prepackaged elements, and we've transitioned to a more normal way otherwise, right? Because the spirit of it... The people involved were more important than what we thought our rules were. And I could go a hundred different directions with that. You in your mind might go a hundred different directions with that. Some of the ways would upset some of you. Others of the ways would upset others of you. We won't have to go there. But where in your own experience of 
God and God's grace, what you would define as Christianity, can you push that boundary? Can you get outside of your box? Can you think about things in a new way that might reach a new person or a new demographic or somebody who's totally different from you? How can you go beyond your definition of holiness, your definition of righteousness, to see the way that the Spirit of God is inhabiting someone else. That's what this really is about. And there are all kinds of rules, all kinds of rituals that we all love a lot. I love my routine. But God challenges us in our freedom to be free to give that to other people. That is the challenge of this passage, and that's the challenge of what it means to be a follower of Jesus to be free for God's kingdom. Let's pray together about what that looks like for us. God of grace and mercy, we hear the spirit of the law and the letter of it, and sometimes we get confused. We can't quite remember what the reason, the purpose is for the rules and the rituals and the things that you've given to us. But by your spirit, God, in that freedom that you gave to us when we said yes to following you, make us free to see other people, to offer them your love and your grace, to offer them your freedom, and to live into that. God, we give you thanks for all of the ways that you have freed so many of us. And for those today, God, that do not yet feel free, we pray that they would experience your freedom now. Freedom from the things that are weighing on them. Freedom from the things that none of us can see. Freedom for your kingdom. Challenge us, empower us, love us so well, God, that we cannot do anything other than share that love with our world that everyone might know your love and your freedom. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit to sense God's freedoms, freedom for you and to share that in love with our world. Amen.